parliamentary budget officer confirm that the cost is $1,500 for the average Nova Scotia family. The parliamentary budget officer clearly spelled out that 8 out of 10 Canadian families in areas where the price on pollution applies get more money back every year than they pay in the price on pollution. How can both the main party leaders get such different results? Well, let's go through the actual report. The PBO report is pretty easy. We can start with table one here. Table one is looking at the physical costs of carbon tax, so fuel and natural gas mostly. This report shows that most households will receive more back on their rebates than at costs. This is largely driven by the disparity in CO2 emissions from richer people and poorer people. This drives up the average CO2 emissions, but rebates are given back on percentiles. In this case, about 80% of people will receive more back than it costs them directly. Table two is what's getting most the attention from Polyev. And if I wanted to misrepresent climate change and carbon taxes, I would use this table as well without any further context. This is what the table actually says, that the overall economic impacts on things like employment losses, mostly in the oil and gas sector, and loss of investment in those sectors will have broad economic harms. This report specifically doesn't include the positives of these initiatives, like how companies will adapt, how much the carbon import taxes will be saved when exporting to other countries, the jobs created by investing in renewables, what the cost of doing absolutely nothing is. We know the do-nothing case is the absolute worst, and as I showed in my previous videos, Polyev's technology over taxes is even more costly than the carbon tax. Everything has a cost, and mitigation is much cheaper than adaptation. So what Polyev has done is he's only looking at the negatives and none of the positives, and then swinging the report to act like it's in his favor, when it's actually the opposite. The Saskatchewan Premier, whose province has the only industrial carbon capture and storage facility in Canada, even admitted that other options they investigated were too expensive. If you don't believe me, look at what the guy who built the report actually said. Okay, most families will still get more in rebates than they pay, and sort of straight cash out, straight cash in. Is that a fair representation? That's a fair representation of our report. That's the conclusion we arrived at. And this is the line from the report the Conservatives point to. Once you factor in the rebate, but also the economic impacts, the majority of the households will see a negative impact as a result of the carbon tax. The rebuttal to that conclusion is that it doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't look at other options and other impacts. What do you say in terms of people understanding the meaning of that analysis? So the analysis looks at the world where the, we have a carbon tax versus the absence of a carbon tax, which is how we do economic analysis. So the impact of a carbon tax on the economy will have impacts on some sectors, the transportation sector, to take one example, or the oil and gas sector. Mm -hmm. A lot of experts about this. So we had Chris Reagan, who works at McGill University, who was part of the Ecofiscal Commission. He says you don't have to use carbon pricing to accomplish your climate goals, but he argues it's the least expensive and least intrusive uh, option for, for the economy. You talked about subsidies, you talked about regulation. Would they be more or less expensive, more or less harmful to the economic picture than carbon pricing, in your view? Well, the consensus among economists is, generally speaking, a carbon tax is probably the least least disruptive way to reduce emissions. Test this compared to another proposal because there's no other proposal to assess, right? Uh, you also don't factor in the cost of climate change. We've seen massive wildfires still burning from last year throughout the winter in British Columbia and in Alberta. You know, the extreme weather on the East Coast, flooding and, mm -hmm. and, and storms. All of that has a massive economic impact as well and a loss of productivity and cost to governments. Um, the idea is to stop that from getting worse or more frequent. How do we assess that versus, you know, the cost of, of, of using carbon pricing to lower emissions? That's a very difficult field to, to venture into because the number of unusual weather events that's occurring, uh, we don't know which ones are due to climate change and which ones would have occurred anyways or whether right. their extent would have been smaller or, or even worse, uh, probably smaller, So, in a, especially in a short period of time. We've tried to estimate the impact of climate change between now and 2100, the year 2100, and we find that there is a cost to climate change. But for the next few years, the, between now and 2030, it's very difficult to determine precisely the cost of climate change. So it's, mm. it's an area that we've ventured into, but it's not easy and not that many institutions and organizations have established clear parameters under which to estimate the cost of climate change. So we, we also have um, a, a criticism of, of relying solely on this analysis. I'm not saying the analysis was bad, but relying solely on this because of its limits. You don't see the economic benefits of the transition to a, a net zero economy. You're seeing a lot of capital flowing into projects like that. There is musing about the possibility of border adjustment tariffs for mm -hmm. people that don't have carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. So that could be a cost that uh, the Canadian economy incurs if they get rid of uh, a carbon pricing. So so how do we assess that, right? Because people like look at the, the price of a liter of gas is going to go up by 3.3 cents, and that is what's driving all of this. But these other future costs and opportunities, we don't have a rebuttal number on it so people can make a clear assessment. How should people view these things? Well, the benefits of introducing new technologies or weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels uh, will probably happen beyond 2030, which is the time horizon mm. of our reports. So it's very unlikely that there'll be significant technological breakthroughs between now and 2030 sufficient to even partially offset the cost of a carbon tax, for example, or any measures to mitigate or reduce our, our carbon emissions. But it's quite possible that beyond 2030, once technologies become more mature, they'll be able to offset some of the costs that we'll, we'll have to incur to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So that's why it's, it's difficult to say whether the costs will be, um, will be offset by the benefits. 
over the longer term, but between now and 2030, it's clearly not going to happen. If you think of any technological measures mm. that governments rely on, it usually takes several, several years for them to become sufficiently mature to be right. widespread. But, but really, I guess the horizon for that is more like 2050, right? When we're looking at the net zero uh, target for, for the mid part of the century, we kind of have to think of that horizon, I, yes. I, I suppose. Polyev, you can't just quote a report, take the value that you like, and then ignore the person who actually made the report. Not only that, Polyev cherry-picked just a portion of what Eve said and then put that on his YouTube channel. This is just dishonesty to its fullest extent. He's completely ignoring the full context. But overall, in a sense, Polyev is correct. The carbon tax will cost Canadians. But if you were actually honest about the document, maybe don't cherry-pick the parts you like and leave out the context that disagrees with you. What was it that you said to Trudeau, Mr. Polyev? Mr. Speaker, that Prime Minister should be taking economics lessons from everyone. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's about time he took some lessons. Why doesn't he go to the library and do a little bit of studying? Maybe Polyev should listen to his own advice and read an economics textbook. Or maybe he just embodies the Dunning-Kruger effect. When comparing the carbon tax to any other option available, it's the lowest cost option. Thanks.